Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to continue, I think we did this last time on the survey through the book of Matthew, but we're going to kind of go through it and get right to chapter 8 here as we look at this book concerning Jesus, concerning Jesus, the sweetest name I know. So let's let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, we do thank you for this. and. We do pray for each person and their need. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Pray for uh, those that were mentioned and those that uh, we mentioned in the service. And, and Lord, we just ask that you bless each one and help every need. And we commit them to you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking at Matthew chapter 1. And it begins with the genealogy of Jesus. And Jesus was to come from David and Abraham. And that's what it says right here. And we know that Jesus is no imposter because Jesus fulfills the genealogy that are in the Bible. Yeah. And then we see his identity in chapter 1. And she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So the father is letting her know the name of Jesus. Okay, so his identity is mentioned. Then we find his birth in verse number 1. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then the introduction of Jesus. And so we find that in chapter 3, in verse 17. Where it says, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. And so God gives the introduction of Jesus. And then we find his temptation in chapter 4. And we find that in verse 1 and 2. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. And so we find the temptation of Jesus. 
And so we're looking at concerning Jesus, his genealogy, his identity, his birth, and here is the great introduction, and then the temptation. And that was a terrible temptation that took place. And then the teaching of Jesus, and that's what we looked at last time. And that's chapter 4, verse 15, going all the way through chapter 7, the teaching of Jesus. And we looked at how that impacted the world, the teaching of Christ. And so, look at chapter 4, verse 15. It says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, Light is sprung up. When nations are ready to die, Jesus can intervene. And they continue to live. They were in the shadow of death in that day. But light came. And these people found truth. And it preserved their culture in a great way. And so that's what Jesus will do. And then we find the teaching. And now today we're going to look at the demonstration of the life of Jesus. Okay? And this was through his miracles we find in chapter 8 and other things. And so go to chapter 8. Wasn't that quick to get all the way to chapter 8? Boy, I tell you. And so in chapter 8, we're looking at some things concerning the Lord Jesus. Now, when you look at the teaching of Jesus, it taught the people how to live, how to pray, and uh, how to set goals, and how to interrelate to God and people. Okay, that was the teaching of Jesus. But in the demonstration of Jesus, where he does these miracles, we learn about his divinity. And we learn about his sovereignty. And so Jesus is divine. And he's sovereign. That means he's all powerful. We learn that. Jesus has power over the animal world. The physical world. Even gravity. I mean, Jesus can defy gravity. We learn this all through the miracles of Christ. And he has power over the physical world. The physical world. And so, he can heal diseases. He can help people that are blind to see. He can do all these things. Now, if you think that these healers that are bumping people on the head and they're falling down flat and everything is of God. I'm sorry. That's not a God. Okay. Uh, that's a big money racket. That's what that is. The healing. But Jesus, he really could do that. You see, these healers wear glasses. They get old. Well, why don't you heal yourself of getting old? You see? The reason for the miracles of Christ is to demonstrate who Jesus is. Right. We don't need to demonstrate who Jesus is by miracles anymore. We have the Bible. And it tells us that time frame that Jesus demonstrated these things. You see. If we try to imitate all that, what we're doing, we're trying to be Jesus ourselves. You understand? So there's Christ and there's the spirit of Antichrist. And so the devil always mimics Jesus. Now, what is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Is it a nice little docile animal that you can pet and you can feed graham crackers? No. If you give a wolf a graham cracker, what's he liable to do? He's liable to chew your arm off. Okay? They're not nice. And so, Jesus said, you'll know them by their what? Fruits. Fruits. So if something inside you says, something about that just doesn't look right, guess what? It's not. If you know the truth. And so, the truth is what sets us free. Now, we're looking at the demonstration of Jesus. And this proves His divinity and His sovereignty. He's got all the power. Okay? Jesus not only was sovereign, 
we see his deity, that he is God incarnate. You know what all false religions teach? They all teach that Jesus is not divine. He is not God. Or they alter that belief. You know what else? All false religions, they teach you have to work and be good to get to heaven. But guess what? Nobody is good enough to work to get to heaven. Amen. If we were, would we need Jesus? No. If we were good enough, would God send his son to die? No. If we were good enough, we would not need Jesus. So the devil, he loves to imitate things about God, but he doesn't tell the truth. Right. The truth is what sets us free. And so, this demonstration of the life of Jesus teaches his superiority over the devil. He's superior over the devil. He has more power. The devil has power, but Jesus has way more power than the devil. And so, this is what we see in this chapter. We learn about what happens to those that get close to Jesus. So we're going to look at that. Do you want to be close to Jesus? Amen. All right. Well, this is what happens when you do. And this is what happened to them. And so what we're looking at is what happens when people get close to Jesus. You see, what people need is clarity and reality of Jesus. We just need to see who he really is. If we're going to get help, we got to identify who Jesus is. And what people need is to experience meeting Him. You know, we can know about someone, but we can't get any help till we meet them. And when it comes to Jesus, you know, you can know, uh, we got stuck back in the snow a couple years ago, and uh, Diane was there at her home close to where we got stuck and we went to her house said do you know anybody can get us out of the ditch we're stuck in the ditch I didn't get any help till I met that individual and when I met him he took his truck and he pulled the truck back where we were and got a chain and he pulled us out See, I could know about him but until I meet him I didn't get any help until I met this person That's right. do you understand we got to meet Jesus and so, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. When you meet Jesus, he'll put you in his family. He'll save your soul, and he'll put you in his family. Amen. And so, what happens when people meet Jesus? Well, number one, every problem that you have will be solved. You say, what, what, how can that be? Because when he comes in, if you don't get it solved right now, it's going to get solved in the future. Amen. So sickness, God, he allows people to be sick because, it's not because they're so bad. Christians can be sick. Now, sometimes it is because they're not doing right, but they can be sick or have things go wrong so that they'll look forward to when God fixes it in the future. Yeah. Because he's going to fix it one day. If he doesn't fix it now, he does heal some people. But it's not being zapped, okay? And, and then straightening out, look like you're levitating and falling backwards. Okay? What do you do in the Bible if you're sick? It says, if it's any sick among you, Call for the elders of the church. It's not just one person. Call the healer. It's a call for the elders of the church. And they can pray for that individual. They'll put their hands on them and pray for them. And God could raise them up. But he doesn't always. Some people he wants to leave in suspense. Until they get to heaven. It's like, hey! I can walk now. My hip doesn't hurt. My shoulder doesn't hurt. My elbow doesn't hurt. My tongue doesn't hurt. Right, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> my neck's fixed. 
My teeth are all there. Wow, I'm in heaven. Okay? And so, when we meet Jesus, every problem we have, this is what happens when we meet Jesus. It's either solved immediately, like I, I had a problem with um, alcohol before I accepted Jesus. When I was 18 years old, I drank as a teenager. My dad did it all the time, so I did. I was following my dad. God just took it all away. And some other compulsions and habits and different things. But guess what? He didn't take away the desire for nicotine. That took some time. Okay? Took some time. And uh, prayer and, and, you know, sometimes... People just don't get everything fixed, you know. None of us do, okay? Because you're not totally mature until you get to heaven spiritually, okay? The Bible says when we get saved, we're like little babies. And we need to grow, okay? Little babies need to grow. And so I like to watch young people growing up. And I say, are you going to be the tallest? And sometimes they surprise you. Because like Jeremiah, he was just a little guy. And now he, man, that kid just keeps going. I was like, man, he was so little. Look at him. And so I said, Josiah, that gives you hope. Because Josiah, he's a little guy. He's a little guy. And so we need to grow spiritually. We need to grow. And so Jesus, he, though God looks at us as if we are totally mature in a state like Jesus. In other words, spiritually you can't get any better in, as far as having the clothing of righteousness that God gives you right that's perfect his clothing is perfect it covers our sin perfectly that's called your standing that's how you stand with God he sees you that way and you spend the rest of your life trying to live up to it and try to be consistent in that way it's kind of like if I walked up to Mark and I was a stranger and I said, Mark, I've got a job for you. I want you to be an ambassador for my country. Let's say I was from another country. And Mark's like, ambassador? I don't know what they do. Well, I'll show you. And, and he begins to, he finds himself in this position. You know, he's got these clothes on. He's sitting there and he's sitting at a table with these dignitaries in another country. It's like, I'm an ambassador, but what do I do? And it's like, just be, do the best you can. I'll show you. So he's like, well, I'll try to live up to it, but I don't really know how. And little by little, he learns. And he gets more settled in that position. When we get saved, we're children of the king. Amen. And we're ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives for Jesus. And so we learn how to better do that as time goes on. But it doesn't change our position. And so we want to be consistent. We want to do the best we can. We want to be faithful at our job. Being a Christian, we want to be consistent. We want to be faithful to God. Amen. And so we find Jesus solved the problems. Physical problems, spiritual problems, circumstantial problems, emotional problems. This is the name of few. And so Jesus proves he can do this by his life, by his ministry. He can do it now, or he may wait till the future, but he can solve our problems if we're saved. But if we're not saved and we've never accepted Jesus, our problems aren't going to get solved after we die. They're, they're going to get a lot worse. I said we. I, I'm not included. Those that don't get saved. Yeah. They refuse Jesus. Now, no, I don't want that religion. Oh, that's for you, you holy rollers. We don't like that. Don't talk to us about that. No, their problem just begins. Because the Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It talks about the rich man in hell. He lifted up his eyes. He didn't think he was going there. He was surprised. Now he's burning and he's wanting out and he's wanting somebody to tell his brothers who are still alive about how bad it is. And he was told they have the Bible. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. They have what they need. 
Listen, we're responsible to this book. Amen. And so, Jesus shows us He can take care of all problems. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 8. And so it begins with Jesus helping the hopeless. There's the lepers. Verse 3. Notice in verse 3. It says that Jesus put forth His hand and touched Him, saying, I will be thou clean. And His leprosy was cleansed. So this was a hopeless case. Today, leprosy can be cured. But back then it could not. He was totally hopeless. Aren't you glad for medical science? Yes. Do you realize just blood pressure medicine is extending lives by years? Just that. Aspirin. Tylenol. People used to die all the time with fevers. We've got all this medical science. And they've got, you know, figuring out how to do all these different things. Well, that day, it was a hopeless situation. Here's the centurion. It looks like his servant had a terrible fever. He didn't have Tylenol. We find that in verse 5. And his servant was healed. Look at verse number 6, chapter 8. And he says, My servant lies homesick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And so, Jesus healed this man. And then we find Peter's mother-in-law. Okay? So here's Peter. He's supposed to be the first pope. Well, what's he doing with a mother-in-law? Popes don't get married. He's the only man that you can find that has a mother-in-law. And he says he's not married. But here she is. She's, she's sick. Okay? And verse 14. And when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother. Okay? So there it says he's got a wife. Yeah. Popes aren't supposed to have wives. Peter's supposed to be the first pope. He's got a wife. Why don't the rest of them have wives? They need to read their Bible. The King James Bible. Okay? And so Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her. So getting close to Jesus, Amen. that solved their problems. But wait a minute. Is she still alive today? Where's Peter's mother-in-law? Is she still alive? Jesus healed her? No, she died. So everyone Jesus healed, everyone that he rose from the dead, he went to the grave. So what's it tell us? It was a temporary thing to prove us who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the only Messiah. It's not everybody going out claiming to do all these, these miracles and everything. We don't need a bunch of Jesuses. We only have one. Amen. And he proved it, and this validates the Bible. This tells us this is truly the Word of God. And the life of Jesus. When we get close to Him, He helps the hopeless. Here's verse 16. Someone possessed of the devil. And when the even, even was come, verse 16, they brought unto Him many that were possessed with the devils, and He cast out the spirits with His word. So here's Jesus fixing people with the devil problem. Now you probably never met anybody like that. But I'll tell you what. They were back in those days. No, they got them today too. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. Okay? And so Jesus can fix the worst of sin. And so the devil, he inhabited these people and he cast out the devil. And so this shows us he helps the hopeless. You say, that's a hopeless case. Why, you would have met me back in 1980 and say, boy, that's a hopeless case. <laughs> but God saved me. Yeah. And He gave me, I don't deserve it, but He helps the hopeless. Yeah. He helped all these people. They didn't have answers for leprosy. They were hopeless. The centurion ser servant with palsy, they didn't have any help for that. You know what? We've got people today and it seems there's no remedy. But if they get saved, they may remain sick, but the remedy is later. He will help them. 
And so Paul talked about leaving someone sick. Someone he loved, he left him sick. Well, I thought Paul had healing ability. That slowly dissipated to get our focus on Jesus. See, those people confirmed Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Let me show you that. Mark chapter 16. We're going to take a little turn here for just a minute. <clears throat> Mark 16. It says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Okay? That's in verse 17. So, in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and shall recover. Now, that's what they're going to do. But wait a minute. Jesus is talking about people right after he was there on, pub, on earth. And what are these people supposed to do? What was apostles supposed to do? What was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John supposed to do? They're supposed to record and prove that Jesus really is the person that he said he was. Mm -hmm. Then go on to verse number 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and what did they do? Confirming the word with signs. Mm -hmm. Now look, the word wasn't complete yet. Do you understand? Paul hadn't given us the epistles yet. But that now, listen to me. Don't miss this. It's confirmed by their ministries. Jesus endorsed them, and they, he gave them these powers, but that confirmed their word. Now guess what? The word's complete. Amen. Now, I'm not saying God can't heal. He can. I know one girl. She was a little girl, Bethany Wilson. They gave up on her, had leukemia. I had a sister who died of leukemia in 1969. I was not, I didn't know the Lord. My parents didn't really know the Lord. She died of leukemia. But that little girl, the whole church, First Baptist Church of Milford, Ohio, people were praying. I believe they laid hands and they prayed for her. God healed Bethany Wilson of something that was incurable, leukemia. So God can heal. Don't Amen. think I don't believe that. I do. But we got to do it the Bible way. Amen. we got to do it how God said. Amen. And so, but these confirm the word. So we don't need, they say, well, you know, we got to have all these signs and wonders. No, we already believe based on this book. Jesus is the Son of God. He fulfills the, the chronological aspect of the Bible. He fulfilled the divine aspect of the Bible. He endorsed those, and they endorsed him, and he gave them the same ability in some respect, but not completely. And then he gave us the book. We don't need all that, all the fireworks anymore. No more than we need shaking of mountains. When, you know, uh, Moses went up on the mountain, the earth shook, lightning and thunder, but then what did Moses get? A copy of the Bible. So then Jesus came, did some earth-shaking things, left us a New Testament. So, but it wasn't complete. Then here comes the Apostle Paul. He's doing all these things, confirming the Word. But now, we've got the Word. So just believe it. Amen. Just believe it. And follow the Word. Okay, so, getting close to Jesus means help for the hopeless and it means guidance for the aimless you know people are aimlessly going along you take an arrow I don't know if you've ever done it but take an arrow and just shoot it I don't know where it's going but it was cool going up and out of sight I'm not going to tell you that what we used to do <laughs> that was about the dumbest thing a kid can possibly do. Yep. No fear. <laughs> Just the grace of God, nobody you know, got to wear, wear an arrow. <laughs> but I tell you what, there's a lot of aimless people. Arrows are meant to hit targets. 
And God has a target for all of us. And that target is His will. And it starts with accepting Jesus as our Savior. And then following whatever it is He wants us to do. And that doesn't have to be some great thing. Just obeying God on a daily basis and loving Him. Having a relationship with Him. And serving Him. However He wants us to do. Amen. And so, here's somebody, he said in chapter 8, look at verse 19, back in Matthew. <clears throat> verse 19. A certain scribe came, to, came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. He said, I'll go anywhere you go. Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds have nests but the son of man hath not where to lay his head what he's saying is you follow me and you're not going to be as secure as you may want to be so he probably liked his house he probably liked his dwelling and when he said I'll follow you what he was thinking is temporarily I'll follow for today or tomorrow but I'm going back to whatever I want to do after that but what we're looking at is Jesus wants us to follow him and your life isn't aimless but it has purpose Amen. because God gives meaning he gives meaning and then we find verse 21 and another of his disciples said unto him Suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. What's he saying? What I have for you is going to be more meaningful than the family, activities, relationships, things that you're doing. It's going to be more meaningful and purposeful. And just whatever's taking that place is secondary secondary and so when we get close to Jesus he gives direction for that those that are aimless and then security for those that live in dangerous perilous times he's our security Amen. you know if you are living in Palestine today it's not very secure life is very temporary to you it's, it's a horrendous problem. But you know what Jesus can do? He can give security in perilous times. You know, those that were attacked, if you read some of the testimonies, this one guy, he said, I feel reborn. He said, the whole world's new to me. He said, I can't explain it, but I don't know. It sounds like he got saved is what it sounds like. He heard the gospel and he must have... In the, but he was showing, you see that bullet hole, that bullet hole, that bullet hole? I was standing right here, and it was almost an outline around him, you know. He's like, secure in Christ. I guess he must have said, this is the only thing I could, listening to him, and I'm pretty good at detecting if somebody gets saved. My neighbor, his name was Tom. And he'd go by where we used to live in Pennsylvania, and I'd say, hey, Tom. And, and he'd just kind of, and then after a while, he wouldn't even wave. One day I went and prayed and I said, Lord, why doesn't he wave? I'm being nice to him. Why isn't he waving back at me? I, I'm just trying to be nice. And then one day, a few you know, months went by. Maybe it was even a year or two. And Tom come walking by and he went. And then he went to his house. I went in the house. I said, Amy, Tom got saved. I Call his wife. I think he got saved. <laughs> She called up. Guess what? Tom got saved. And I wound up baptizing Tom. And so he waved ever since. You see, something happens when people get saved. And so Jesus, he changes lives. And he helps us in these perilous times that we're in. And he changes things. He is our protection and you can identify people that get saved. That guy, 
He said, I feel reborn. Everything's new. I just, I was like, man, something happened to that guy. He, he's being shot at. But why he's being shot at? He must have said a prayer. Lord, what David told me about accepting you, the best I know how, I believe you died for me. I believe you're real. I believe, would you save me? And God must have saved me. I don't get, we didn't get the whole story. But He is our protection. He's our help. And uh, we find the disciples get in a storm. And notice, go to chapter 8 again and look in Matthew 8, verse number 24. Chapter 8, verse 24. <clears throat> says, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. How could a ship be covered with waves and Jesus be asleep? How can that be? If it's covered with waves, the water, back then, those ships weren't enclosed. You would think the water would hit him unless they had some kind of canopy in and the, the disciples were holding up the canopy to protect Jesus. I don't know. But he's asleep. And the disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And so here are people not only are hopeless and aimless, but here, they were helpless without Jesus. And he can help people that are helpless. Amen. And then Jesus gets over and he meets in one passage it talks about one person full of the devil. In another passage where we're reading here, it talks about two men. In verse 28, And when he came to the other side unto the country of Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fears so that no man might pass by the way. And so these people were fierce. If you go over to Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> Look at verse number 22. There cometh... I'm sorry. Let me get there myself. Mark chapter 5 verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So here's somebody who can break the chains on a handcuff. I mean, he was strong, superhuman strength. You know, when people are full of the devil, they're very, very strong. And then notice, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and it says the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. This man was a miserable mess. And when he saw Jesus afar so off, he ran and worshipped him. You know, not everybody that comes to church is full of God. It's true. He's worshipping God. But he's full of devil. And so, I can't explain that exactly, but he recognized who Jesus was. You know, a lot of people today, they don't recognize who Jesus is. But here's a man full of the devil, and he knows. And so... Here's a man who is in great need. And he is hopeless. And he is aimless. And he is helpless. He's all of the above. And so he, this man needs Jesus. And back in Matthew chapter 8, we find, again, talking about these, these demonics. <clears throat> full of the devil. <clears throat> and uh, we see that here. 
verse 29, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? This is the devil crying out within him. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And Jesus cast the devils into the pigs. And so we find the devils beside him saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. Some say there were 2,000 pigs. And there were so many devils in this one person, or there were two in the other passage. There were so many. There were enough to drown 2,000 pigs. That's a problem. Okay? How much does that cost? Well, you can ask Jonathan because he just bought a pig recently. And uh, I think it was he paid over $1,000 or something. So, here's 2000 times a thousand how much is that that's two million dollars worth of bacon <laughs> now do you think a farmer's going to be upset if two million dollars worth of his bacon goes into the sea and drowns how are you going to process two thousand pigs that quickly he's going to lose them I don't know I don't know what they did with them but here, Jesus cast the devils out of the man into the pigs. And so these were soulless pigs full of devil. And these were clueless pigs full of the devil. And we find the devil was bodiless. And he's full of pig. Amen. That's right. And so... What happens to that? You've got the devil getting baptized in the pig. A lot of devils getting baptized. So what's that tell you? Not everybody that gets baptized is going to heaven. Right. Amen? Right. Okay. So, <laughs> forgive my humor, but <clears throat> listen. We don't want to be hopeless. When the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, and we're going to close here pretty soon, turn to Romans chapter 5. We don't want to be hopeless. What's Romans 5.12 say? It says, As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Sounds hopeless. But look at verse 8. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look, we don't want to be hopeless because Jesus paid the price for our sin. We don't have to be aimless. It says, there's none righteous. All have sinned. You know what that means? You missed the mark. Your arrow missed the mark. You didn't live perfectly. I didn't live perfectly. We missed it. We all sinned. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we got the sin problem. We got the death problem. But we have the cure. Jesus. And so when we get close to Jesus, we don't have to be endless. We don't have to be hopeless and helpless. They were in the sea. What did Jesus do? He calmed the storm. Here's the maniac. I mean, he's ripping his clothes off. He's busting the chains off. He's running the people off. And he meets Jesus. And so a maniac turned evangelist. Jesus told him, you go tell the people. And the people, they didn't want Jesus. And we don't have any record of Jesus going back to that place. You know what they said to Jesus? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 8. And we'll see. <clears throat> after Jesus cast the devils out of the maniac, and after the, the 2,000 swine went down into the Sea of Galilee and drowned, people started talking. And... Uh, Verse 33, they, they kept them fled. So they saw that and they ran out of there. And when their 
ways, it says, and went their ways into the city and told everything what had befallen the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came to meet Jesus. Boy, that's good. Everybody came to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. They said, we don't want you here. Leave. We don't have any record of Jesus coming back. But this one man was left behind. Maybe Jesus didn't need to. And that man became an evangelist among those people. And that shows us that you don't have to have all your theology just right and your outline and everything to go tell somebody about your faith in Jesus. This man didn't have any theological training. But he is able to go tell people about Jesus. Amen. And so, meeting Jesus changed everything. It changed everything even among the faithless. The faithless. Why? Because now they're accountable. They're accountable. Even though they didn't let Jesus' life affect them immediately, we don't know. We hope that people were saved. And so, meeting Jesus meant deliverance. It meant purpose for a useless maniac who turned evangelist. And so, what can Jesus do for us? That's the question. What can He do for us? He can make us useful. He can make you hopeful. He can put direction in your life. He can help us. Jesus can do all that. Amen. And so I'm glad I met Jesus. Aren't you? Amen. He's, he's the answer that people need. Look, we're all just going through life real fast. And the older you get, the faster it seems it goes. But Jesus is going to solve, if you know the Lord is your Savior, every single problem you ever could think of. Every one that we have and every one that we can even think of. Unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before His presence with exceeding joy. Amen. This is what He can do. He can present you perfect before the Father. You know, the only thing in heaven that man made was the holes in Jesus' body, His hands and His feet. The only thing the side. The only thing man has created in heaven. But everything else God has made and it's good. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to realize the answers that you provide for our every need. And let us rejoice that you are in control of all things. Lord, help us look forward to heaven. And all the problems are solved. Lord, until then, help us be faithful. Do your will each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.